Hello and welcome to the 27th edition of Half Hour, a podcast starring me, John Paulo Gittis. He is your host. In today's episode, I will discuss disputed territories with Vladislav Kivisky. Kievsky? Kievsky. Oh, these names are yeah, hard, that's, man. That's almost right, man. That's good. But thank you for coming on the show. Thank I appreciate it. Thank you for having it. me. Thank um, you for I get it with the names, though, because my, my last name is is tough. Like, I always had a tough time in, in school yeah. in the U.S. It's not like Smith, you know? <laughs> but, um, yeah, so welcome to the show. If you want to tell us a little about yourself, like, you know, where you're from, what you're doing here at, at school, and stuff like that. Yeah, sure. Uh, actually... I came to the Czech Republic about two years ago, mm-hmm. and currently I'm a student. I'm a business student at the University of New York in Prague, and yeah, that's that's what about me. I I'm studying here. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to expand my knowledge, my experience, and all that stuff. So yeah, like this. There that you go. Thing. And so you're coming from Ukraine, right? Yep. Okay. Um, that's pretty cool. So what? Um, what has the experience been like here as opposed to, to there? Like, has, what differences have you seen? I mean, I know for me personally, I, I come here and I look at all the road signs and I have no clue what they say. But that's like, that was like one of my first like things that, that stuck out to me like when I got here. Yeah, of course. Actually, language differences is like the, the biggest part of the first mm-hmm. impression I'd like to say about the Czech Republic. Uh, but to be honest, it's really similar to Ukrainian language. So... I had a big problem with that, and I I studied um, Czech language too, so it wasn't a big deal for me. But I don't know it's probably mostly related to people. The big difference in people in the Czech Republic, they are more open, I'd like to say, like mm-hmm. this, because in Ukraine, uh, I think it's like the feature of the Eastern Europe at all that the majority of people just really closed and they don't like to you know we, we don't have that stuff like small talk in the united states you know we just cannot uh say to stranger hello how how, how you going and like that stuff mm-hmm. uh yeah that was a big difference and uh, that every time everybody says hello to you like in any place if you go to the shop if you go to the uh to the restaurant like that, that's pretty unusual for me and in yeah. ukraine it's not so um like open this way like yeah i i'd like to say that probably yes because i know uh probably in ukraine people more tough i'd like to say like this now kind of getting into the to the meat of it like um ukraine does have some disputed territories very yeah. v- i would say it's the most it's the most obvious case in the world right now mm-hmm. um I mean, you could probably say North and South Korea, but that's a little less violent right now. Um, but um, yeah, so what in Ukraine? It's you got the before the war, before mm-hmm. February twenty fourth, yep, twenty twenty two. You had these breakaway regions. Um, mm-hmm. I know, I know, in English and in Ukrainian, there's two different like endonyms or exonym names. Mm-hmm. Like they they use different terms. So I. From what I understand, it's Luhansk and Donetsk. Yeah, that's those two. Yeah, that's cities, and also Crimea. That's Crimea. Like, yeah. yeah, that's that that's, one was pretty obvious. Yeah, actually, and the problem of, of disputed territories is like mm-hmm. a pretty common thing in the world. We can talk about the Kosovo; it's uh-huh. also a disputed territory. We can talk about Africa; that's probably um, West Africa. If you're talking about uh, Algeria. Uh, the west part of Algeria, or if you're talking about Ethiopia, it's the western part of Ethiopia, also disputed territory. Mm-hmm. Especially, we can remember a case with China and Taiwan. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. The, that's the big problem, and um, it's a big noise around that stuff. And especially if you're talking about uh, Middle East, if you're talking about Arabic countries, Israel, and all the countries around the world, especially Arabic and African countries, as I say previously, it's a really common thing in the in these countries. But mm-hmm. uh, oh yeah, like Israel Palestine. Yeah, yeah, this conflict. It's a very uh, it's a very hot issue. I know at school yeah. here. I'm in the international relations track, and it's it can be very uh, <laughs> very tough in class sometimes yeah. talking about it. Yeah, for sure. And I'd like to say why I actually want to talk about this topic because. Uh, I have some experience in history 
uh, back in Ukraine, I used to be an active member of the Junior Academy of Science of Ukraine okay. in the field of uh, history, actually. Mm -hmm. And I used to be an active researcher and I published two scientific works. The first one is about the Kiev Mahilan Academy. That's, that's university, one of the oldest universities in Ukraine. And the second work is about hard labor prisons in the Kharkiv region. And yeah, but I know something about the history and I had the experience and I see one big difference if talking about disputed territories, for mm -hmm. example, in Kosovo in, and in Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah, because if talking about Kosovo, that's almost about um, different religions and different nations. Mm -hmm. Because um, Kosovo is, is Islamic, right? Yeah, it's Albanian. Yeah, Kosovo is like the Albanic islamic like this yeah mm -hmm. and what's the problem is because kosovo is like the is the heart of the uh serbian country actually yeah is the heart of serbia because the serbia started in kosovo yeah but then ottoman's empire came and uh to control under kosovo and it changed the demographics yeah of the it region. changed the demographics yeah. mm -hmm. and uh during this century when kosovo was occupied it or was a part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, to that territory came a lot of Islamic people, mm -hmm. and that's the big, the big deal with that stuff because uh, people in Kosovo, which Islamic people, yeah, for them is their saint, saint area, saint uh, territory. Yeah, and and from what I understand, it was like the Ottomans came in and. Um, you know, people were incentivized to to mm -hmm. to become to, Islamic yeah, to become Islam. or to kind of adhere to this by um, like the state would give you less taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the, I think the Janissaries they would take you know young Christian boys, train them mm -hmm. in the Islamic tradition, and be you know soldiers in the Ottoman army. Yeah, um, and you know a lot of people would have their kids go do that voluntarily as well, just mm -hmm. because you know it might might be better than living in a in a village in the middle of nowhere and and you know your quality of life is not not as good and maybe in the army you you know you have a purpose and you have like something to do uh so i i get it like i i get how you know people went involuntarily and voluntarily and yeah. the incentivization that was there um but the albanians yeah they i think they moved in there or they moved into kosovo uh, um, i'm not sure how long they've they've been in Kosovo, but mm -hmm. yeah, I've, I've heard that from some, even from some Serbian people I've met that it's like the heart of Serbia. Yeah. It's like the middle, it's where it began. Um, but there's just so many examples around the world. I mean, you look at, uh, 2008 with the, the Russian invasion of Georgia yeah. and the, the breakaway regions of Ab Abkhazia, South Ossetia. Uh, th that's another example in the, you know, in, in the space of the world. Mm hmm. Yeah, and actually, uh, let me finish with the castle. Mm -hmm. uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, one of the most common reasons for the disputed territories is religion. And uh, we can see it in the castle example. Mm -hmm. The next one is the ethnicity. Mm -hmm. It's about different nations in the territories of different uh, country. Uh, for example, if you talk about the Western Africa, uh, that's the example of different ethnicity because mm -hmm. they have different tribes that lives in different countries or mm -hmm. the same mm -hmm. tribe that live in different countries. Yeah, that's the problem of ethnicity, mm -hmm. and it's really hard to solve this problem because if you're um, if you're a governmental guy, if you're president of or the king, uh, it's really hard to deal with this because uh, it's not just one or two ethnicities, it's like the thousands Many. or like yeah. hundreds of them. And that's the second most common reason, that's ethnicity. And uh, then we have third common reason. It almost related to the political or um, not or, or geopolitical issues in the region yeah mm -hmm. that's for example uh china and taiwan and uh, georgia and russia and ukraine and russia mm -hmm. uh because in ukraine we didn't have different ethnicity uh in this region uh russians propaganda says that uh the majority of people in that regions uh, they were russians but it's actually a lie because you can go to statistics and 
see it that easily find out yeah easily yeah. find out that the majority were ukrainians actually and that's not the ethnicity that's not the religion because uh, all ukrainians um, mm-hmm. hey, christians and not all but the majority of them yeah and i was gonna say orthodox you know that yeah, orthodox yeah. orthodox like russia even romania belarus bulgaria greece those are all orthodox mm-hmm. on that on that side yeah and uh your your there's no religion issue actually about that uh, so here is a rise the political issue and mm-hmm. the political issue uh, from that side uh, because as example of georgia mm-hmm. uh, ukraine i think had the same scenario uh, because georgia uh, was invaded uh, when russians and the government of vladimir putin uh, didn't like their way to they were going to try and join NATO? Uh, yeah, they, they're going to try, yeah. but that's not the, the main reason. The main reason was that um, Saakashvili, that uh, Georgian president at that time, he decided to um, to close Russian military base in Georgia. And, oh, okay. Yeah, and that was the main reason of the invasion, because uh, Russians wanted to save the military base in the this Abkhazia region. Mm-hmm. It was the main reason of mm-hmm. the invasion. And of course, like the sub reason for the television, it was a protection of Russian speaking uh, population in the yeah, territory of Georgia. Yeah, that's, that's a common thing. And uh, I think that uh, Ukraine had the same thing. Uh, how this uh, stuff, these disputed territories in Ukraine started? It started uh, from Crimea, actually. Mm hmm. You know, and I actually, I remember reading about it when I was, mm-hmm. I think I was, um, what, this was 2014, right? In in March of 2014. Yeah. So I remember I was on the bus going to school and I remember telling my, my friend who's now in the military, um, we were sitting on the bus and I'm like, mm-hmm. you believe this? Like we're reading about it, um, which I feel like was a little atypical when you're 12 years old. Like I remember other kids on the bus were kind of just had their headphones in mm-hmm. or having like small talk or whatever. But I remember sitting, I, it's a very vivid memory. Like, I don't know, you just, you know, when you have those memories that really stick out to you, like they just, uh, like you can see them like a movie. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I just remember it reading about so it. Good, yeah. Yeah. But actually, um, the problem that Crimea was the same as with the Abhazia, that, uh, Crimea for a long time, it was the base for the lush, uh, Russian, military battleships it was the heart of the in crimea yeah in okay. crimea okay yeah, B- yeah because they they were rendered it sevastopol the the port yeah, that yeah. was the uh, that was the heart of the black sea uh Fleet. yeah yeah the main fl- i remember um i re- what you're saying like i i can echo that as well because mm-hmm. i remember uh doing some reading about how sevastopol uh, housed this main fleet and Ukraine was uh, thinking about ending Russia's mm-hmm. lease on yeah. the port and Russia just yeah wouldn't have anywhere to put their ships I guess so yeah that, that was the problem for Russians because after the revolution in Ukraine they were afraid that it's gonna be end for their lease in this port it's gonna be end of their military base in the Black Sea and was and that was a problem because without this uh, without this port they would have not have access to the Black Sea mm-hmm. that they they had actually like from the uh, from their region. But the problem is that they will be surrounded by the uh, Ukraine, mm-hmm. Georgia, and Turkey. They would not have access like through the Black Sea to the Mediterranean Sea and uh, to other. Uh, areas in the sea that was the problem they didn't want to and they would kind of by proxy give up their strategic um dominance i guess in the region like mm-hmm. they they don't want to give that to turkey for example yeah yeah uh that was the cornerstone of this problem and uh they just decided to uh, occupy the crimea it was a referendum as mm-hmm. they, they, they liked to do that stuff 
but it was steadily under control of the Russian military police and uh, Russian uh, armed forces. It was the first uh, time when in Ukraine we got uh, disputed territories. It was like a political problem mm -hmm. related to Russia because Ukraine didn't have um, any army at that time that uh, could uh, that could uh, fight against Russia. That was hilarious because yeah, yeah. it just wasn't happening. Yeah, and that was the first time when we got the disputed uh, region in Ukraine, the mm -hmm. Crimea, because of the political and political issues and mm -hmm. um, wants of Russia. And uh, the next part is about the Luhansk and Donetsk regions. Mm -hmm. That's actually the favorite topic for the for the Russian propaganda and for the supporters of this war. Yeah. Is that um, Ukrainian government tried to convince people in, in Luhansk and Donetsk to like speak Ukrainian, to forget about their Russian roots, to uh, do what they want to do and mm -hmm. like that stuff. But that's actually not true. Uh, because uh, after the revolution, it was uh, some, uh, you know, some separatists. Separatists. Yes. I heard they, they, so they didn't take the whole of the two regions. Like if you were to draw the region on the map, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, I, I think we both know how it looks like. I, I looked at the map too and like you have these whole regions yeah. and then they, these separatists only got like half, like they got the two cities, like yeah. Donetsk and Luhansk, but they only got like that little bit. Yeah. And Russia was supporting them. Yeah. From what I That's understand. actually the problem. Because uh, during the revolution, uh, we had uh, separatism in uh, several regions, not just in Luhansk and Donetsk. It, was, uh, it, it also was in my uh, native region, Harki region. It was in Odessa. And um, it was mostly uh, in regions that uh neighboring to russia i was okay i was gonna say like on the edge like on the periphery yeah. okay. but uh what's the problem uh in Kharkiv region for example this problem resolved uh thanks to the uh, s uh, special forces in the mm -hmm. armed forces of ukraine mm -hmm. but in the and Luhansk, uh, in donetsk and luhansk uh russia decided to support this movement and uh they gave the armed forces they gave everything and the point is this separatistic movements it wasn't part of the population of this region that wasn't the main opinion actually that was totally uh, uh, it was totally from the Russian armed forces mm -hmm. that invaded this region in the separatist regions yeah because uh, there wasn't problem about that, and it wasn't separatist movements in this region. I was gonna say it's very convenient that yeah. as the revolution happens, you know these two regions break away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that was the problem. And uh, the main narrative of Russian was that um, in these regions, people want to live with Russia. But that was actually a lie because you can see the statistics, you can see the um, number of people that left this region after the after this started. Was it huge? Like yeah. massive amounts of people? I think it's more than the half of population. Wow. Yeah, that's... And I would assume they're not letting too many people leave from their occupied area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's it's really sad. I And you know, I... I I'm looking at this world map behind us right now, but um, I feel sad because I think with the end of the Cold War, there was a real chance for this problem to kind of mm -hmm. be put to bed. Um, I don't think America acted perfectly. I think that um, we, we kind of exploited the situation a bit. Uh, mm -hmm. What happened with the fall of the Iron Curtain and such. Yeah. Um, I think that countries have the right to choose what they're doing mm -hmm. for sure. Um, I do not side with Russia, but I understand why, like I get it. Mm -hmm. Like I, I see the mindset, but at the same time, I disagree with that mindset because 
I think that generally the the economic improvements you're seeing yep. you know, in Czech Republic, um, in the other you know Eastern states mm-hmm. that have joined the European Union, yep. uh, the, by and large life is getting better for a lot of these people. Yeah, and you know. Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia formerly, mm-hmm. isn't the only country to to suffer from this kind of Russian imperialism. I mean, the Hungarians yeah. got crushed in 1956, the, the Czechs in 1968. Uh, fortunately, you're seeing it now with Ukraine. And I really just think that um, Russia is forever going to be cast as this bad guy in, in this time period because... You know, their their whole strategy hinges on domination of geography in the West, mm-hmm. in the South. You know, there's a reason why Kazakhstan is still in Putin's orbit. You know, mm-hmm. like he wants to keep them there because he's trying to keep out all of these other cultures and ideas from seeping into, you know, Mother Russia. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it, this this disputed these disputed regions are a political vector for him to achieve this. So what, like we said with Abkhazia... Yeah. In South Ossetia, like the reason was for the military base, yeah. but also because, you know, politically it was, it was viable to actually do this. Mm-hmm. You know, you starting an unprovoked war is pretty difficult, you know, yeah. like for the U S we invaded Iraq because they had weapons of mass destruction, mm-hmm. even though they didn't. And, uh, I think that that was probably a huge mistake for the United States to go in there. Um, but it, it just goes to show you like, for those for those of us trying to understand like why you know this war started, mm-hmm. uh, it's partially I think it's a huge mix. You know you have a you know you have a megalomaniac running Russia. He's <laughs> you know Putin is in charge. He is by and large proven that I think I think a lot of people uh, thought the oligarchs had more power, but this is very much against the business interest. Yeah. You know a war like this. Come on, uh, the the German Russian trade that was mm-hmm. going on before this. Germany was trying to basically draw them in economically, yeah. which, in hindsight, doesn't look too good. You know, it's it's really sad that this that their policy failed. Um, but you, I think it's very important for us to understand like why the war started mm-hmm. because, you know, a lot of American politicians, especially, will get on stage and they'll be like, Russia started this invasion; it was unprovoked. Um, I would say. I generally agree with that statement, mm-hmm. but it's very important to see like why the leadership still did it. Yep. You know, like when they say unprovoked, they're trying to put an idea in your head that's like, oh, they just did it for no reason, or yep. they or he did it because he's he's a crazy megalomaniac. No, he did it because because he he saw that that this Western system ran in direct opposition to his own power. Let's not confuse it with Russia because mm-hmm. I think that people generally are not their nation like you can't mm-hmm. put people in those boxes yeah but uh i'd like to say that i don't see uh this as the main reason because um what is the modern war the modern war is not the war at that we had in europe like two centuries ago mm-hmm. because the main reason of that war was to find new territories with new people that mm-hmm. can pay you more taxes and produce more ag- agriculture uh, abilities for your country mm-hmm. and more war abilities for a country because the more people you have the more territories you have yeah just the more, more land more power yeah yeah so your success as a country was totally related to the uh number of territories that you have mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. was the main reason of the war two centuries ago yeah and you look at britain they it's interesting they did what russia did just not like on land, like yeah. Russia expanded on, on, on its land territory yeah. uh, in Eurasia, but mm-hmm. Britain just decided, well, you know, we're stuck on this island, so we'll just go around yeah. the world. So, yeah, and, you're right. Uh, but war has changed, actually. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, that was how empire arised, because as more territories you have, the more powerful you are, and uh, yeah, the more power you have, actually. But today's war is absolutely different because today's economy is not about the uh, amount of people that pay your taxes and that's not the amount of lands that you have. Uh, Today's economy is about your uh, production power. That's Mm -hmm. about uh, the amount of services and products that that you can produce. And 
uh, yep, for example, let's consider the Apple Corporation as an example. Mm-hmm. Russia can invade United States and can take control under Apple. But the problem is that their uh, efficiency inside the heads of the of the Apple stuff, mm-hmm. inside the programmers, inside the IT sector, inside hats is a problem. Mm-hmm. You cannot occupy the territory and got a uh, factory that you want because it's cheaper for you to build this factory on your own territory because during the war, uh, it's really likely that this factory just will be destroyed. Okay. So today's yeah. war is totally not about uh, uh, your production powers. It's not about your economic growth. It's not about your uh, future success uh, as it used to be two centuries ago. And uh, in today's world, um, war is useless for the countries that can produce a sufficient amount of uh, services and products. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the point is for Russia is not uh, economic war. Uh, for Russia is the military war. Yeah. It's like the war, not just for war. I, I think that they have some kind of reason. Yeah, of but course. But this yeah. reason is mm-hmm. absolutely inconvenient for today's world. Yeah, yeah, I would say. I mean, the, they. I think that this war is about... Um, it's about land, definitely, as well. Yeah, but as I said, it's like it's you. If you want to produce, if you want to be econ, if you want to be successful in economic storms, you don't have land. Uh, Russia production has, power. Yeah. yeah, no, you're Ru- correct. I think about how the the U.S. has a system of alliances mm-hmm. in in Europe and in Asia, and that these countries all interact through the ocean. You know, with their yeah. trade. Uh, a very a very um, sea based kind of interaction, which economically makes sense. I mean, mm-hmm. if we're trading, you know, again, if I'm looking at this map, if the U.S. wants to trade with India or wants to trade with with Australia, you're going to use the, the the navy to get there. You're yeah. going to use these. That's why China, you know, with their with their fusion of uh, you know authoritarian politics, but kind of more liberal economics mm-hmm. in a way. Um, they're they're doing okay, I think. I, they're playing a very neutral role in this war. I, I I see on on the outside. I think I think inside that they're they want to see Russia do better because you know that's their only. Um, both countries are against the American worldview. I think, mm-hmm. and I think that's all they share in common. Like mm-hmm. I'm not going to say that Russia and China are best friends, but I will say that they share that in common. China also has border disputes too. I mean. Uh, the South China Sea, they've been militarizing these islands for yeah. for about a decade now. I remember under the Obama administration, they they started uh, in the South China Sea, you know, where Vietnam and the Philippines mm-hmm. are. They actually were raising uh, coral reefs above the ocean and they built these um, ports, military facilities, anti-aircraft units, yeah. like all these things. They're just building these bases in the ocean because they know nobody's going to stop them and the re- the countries in the region are not as powerful. Yeah. You know, like what is the what is the Philippine Coast Guard going to do against the the Chinese Navy? Uh our navy is still stronger than ours but than theirs. But um it it goes to show you that that things are changing. Yeah. And I I think kind of going back to what you were saying with the with the production power mm-hmm. it's it is inconvenient what what Russia is doing in in the 21st yeah. century like and I see uh, what you mean Actually, what was the main idea of the of these disputed territories there? Yeah, because we a bit forgot about this topic. Mm-hmm. Um, the main idea for Russia was uh, they wanted to cut Ukraine from the Black Sea uh, because these uh, separatistic views they uh, they were pretty common with the support of Russia in the regions that near the sea mm-hmm. were, were neighboring to Russia. Mm-hmm. That was the main idea. Uh, but they managed to do it only in two regions. And uh, they're talking about the uh, Russian language and they're talking about the, uh, they're talking about rights of Russian-speaking uh, population. Mm-hmm. But the point is that personally, I in my uh, life, I speak Russian. Mm-hmm. I speak Russian in Ukraine. 
I speak Russian here with my friends from Ukraine. Mm. And that's not a problem with that. I can speak it in the street in any city that I want in Ukraine. And that's not the problem with that. Uh, the only point is that you uh, have to... Um, you have to have your documents in Ukrainian language if you're a business or if you're a governmental uh, guy. So that's only the reason. To me, that is a, like, just coming at it from an American mm-hmm. perspective, it's a very strange idea. Just, yeah. like, not I'm, not I'm not saying, like, what you're doing is wrong. I'm mm-hmm. not even commenting on that. I'm just saying, like, from where I'm from, like... All the all the government documents are in English. Yeah, we have a huge Spanish population that speaks yeah. Spanish, especially in the south. Yeah, so I'm actually I'm trying to learn it. So I only sp- <laughs> I only speak the one language though, and that's kind of what I'm getting to. Where it's like, like to me, it's almost it's similar to like how maybe like. I guess there's not really, I don't know, there's not really much I can say. Like, to me, it's just very strange. Like, you you know, in Ukraine, you have Ukrainian as, like, the, the national language. Yeah. In, in the U.S., fun fact, we don't have a national language, like, mm-hmm. written down. Like, de facto, it's English, but no mm-hmm. one actually wrote it down. But all of the government policies and all of the discussions that you yeah. have in government, it's all in English. But that is, that is like, a, I, I didn't... I didn't expect that actually. Mm-hmm. I thought if I, I pictured that you would speak, you know, Russian to someone who's maybe from like Russia or or you know some of the other post-Soviet countries mm-hmm. like Kazakhstan or like Azerbaijan or something. Yeah. But even even among Ukrainians, you you speak. Uh, that's probably mostly the eastern regions, but uh, the people in these regions are trying to to move to Ukrainian language totally because you know it's hard to speak Russian when the. Uh, people from Russia killing your own people, yeah. so like that stuff, yeah. and uh, yeah, they're trying. But why we speak Ukrainian? Because uh, Ukraine was a part of the Russian Empire for a long time, and the part of the U- USSR for a long time too. And uh, we had legislation that just uh, Ukrainian language was forbidden for Ukrainians to speak. Y- you couldn't write in Ukrainian, you couldn't uh, print books in Ukrainian, you c- couldn't yeah. teach uh, your, your This children. was in the Russian Empire. Yeah, during yeah. the Russian Empire. They tried to like Russify. That. Yeah, and during the, the early USSR, the probably um, 1920s, 1930s, during the Lenin and Stalin period, it mm-hmm. was forbidden too. And that was the, pro- uh, that was the problem why the uh, people in Ukraine, some people in Ukraine speak Russian. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the second reason for Russians to invade, uh, to start the full scale war and to invade into the Donbass region, uh, the second re- uh, reason was that uh, Ukrainian government trying to uh, kill Russian speaking population, that we shell in these cities, that uh, we uh, like trying to eliminate them. Mm-hmm. But that's not true because you can see the statistic that uh, during. Uh, Eight years of war in Tonbass region, mm-hmm. in total, probably 50 people were killed. And during uh, 2016, only five. During 2017, only seven. So it was very much like a stalemate. Just just like lines drawn in the ground, yeah. kick the can down the road, essentially. I, I will say we're getting towards the end here, but I don't know if you want to mention one other thing or anything important you want to say. No, I think that uh, I mentioned the, the main point of, of, from my view as historian, mm-hmm. that um, we can, I just want to repeat it one more time. Yeah, that, of course, of course. Uh, we have three types of disputed territories, three reasons for these disputed territories. The first one is religion, as you can see in Kosovo and Albania. Uh, the second one is ethnicity, as we can see in okay. Africa, for example. Yeah. And uh, if you're talking about Israel, it's like both is ethnicity and this so it religion too. Combined, yeah, it's mix. And the third one, uh, the most probably useless and violent, because you you cannot be without that. If ethnicity and religion is really hard to manage, mm-hmm. but the third one is about the policy of. Uh, of strong countries, you know. Uh, so kind of like the might makes right kind of idea, where it's like yeah. I'm stronger than you, and I'm gonna enforce it. Yeah, like, that's yeah, that's just, uh, that's yeah. like language of power, of yeah. military power. Yeah. And uh, I just wanted to mention that in Ukraine, um, 
the main reason of the uh, of the Donbas region mm -hmm. that was get political and political uh, wants of Russia to control this region, to control the Black Sea region. Mm -hmm. That was and Crimea as well. Uh, that was uh, their willingness to control this um, uh, Black Sea region, as I say, to control, to have their military bases right there. And if you're talking about uh, uh, about uh, Abkhazia, it's the same thing. And China and Taiwan is pretty the same. Yeah, yeah. So luckily, luckily, Taiwan is separated by the ocean. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, China can't enforce its its will like Russia is trying to do. Yeah, uh, I'd like to see a more peaceful world as well. And you know, we can only hope to the future. But man, it has been a pleasure for having you on the show. Thank you very much, Vladislav. Yep. Thank you for um, the show. I'd love to have you on again. Um, Guys, that was episode 27. Uh, stay tuned for the next ones. Um, and yeah, we're just going to keep talking. We're just going to keep learning about what other people think and other cultures around the world. And we'll go from there. So cheers. Peace. <laughs>